welcome to the first in a series of podcasts called The Future Marketeer. And they've been developed by ISBAR and Ingenuity. And uh, the purpose of these sessions are to share some thoughts, inspiration, conversation with the broader marketing and agency world. Um, and I'm delighted that on the first one, we've got a panel of both client and agencies. And um, I'm just going to run through and just introduce the people we've got with us today, I'm delighted to say. Uh, we've got Peter Markey, who is CMO of TSB. We've got Nick Robinson, who is MD and CMO of Kerry Foods. We've got Gen Kobayashi, who's the new Chief Strategy Officer at Engine, who has actually joined Engine during um, the purpose of this lockdown, which I think is quite challenging. And we've got Heather Blundell, who is the MD and UK Client Counsel for Weber Shandwick. And I'm Tracy Barber, and I'm the Global CMO of Havas Creative Group. So welcome, everybody. Um, good to have everybody here. Now, we've got um, an interesting theme today, which is a title which is, in what ways are consumers taking back control? How can marketeers embrace this change? Um, and that's a really interesting concept for me because you know, uh, the whole concept of change, we can all talk about until the cows come home. Um, but what I think is really important is what guides, what clues, what tips we can give people to drive that forward. And there was a wonderful quote that I found that I'm going to have to read because I won't be able to remember it by the futurist um, Steve Brown, who said, stripped of the comfortable illusion of being in control, consumers will move to reassert control over their lives in ways big and small. Um, and I think what's interesting is that whole desire for um, control will drive attitudinal and behavioural change um, across every facet of life, not just around brands and businesses. Um, and at Habas, we've done a study for years. It's a global study and it's called Meaningful Brands. And that assesses the way that um, we can create more meaning for brands and deliver more effective solutions for brands, both in terms of ROI, in terms of um, brand um, building and in terms of the way we create relationships with customers and what come out of that study is three key things one is that you know people look for functional benefits so they they want to know what a product does for them they look for personal benefits which is much more around what you know what is this this product or service doing to make my life easier um, but the final element is the collective benefit and that is the piece that in a sense comes back to the control concept that we're talking about today. Collective benefit is much more about the impact of a brand or business on society. And I think really importantly, what we're seeing off the back of that study, and I think we're all seeing across you know, our businesses and within agencies and clients, is that you know, people are much more concerned and bothered about what a brand is doing um, from a societal point of view, one of the one of the pieces of really interesting information that's just come out um, is that 77% 77 of people prefer to buy from companies who share their values. And in one of the markets that we've just researched, two thirds of consumers are now saying that they'll abandon brands that act only in self-interest. Um, which is actually quite interesting in terms of how that will shift the way we need to respond to um, our customers and how we need to create and change our businesses. So I would like actually just thinking of, you know, the things that are more prevalent at the moment and how things are changing to come to you, Peter, first, because in the financial service environment, um, what are the sort of things that you're seeing, the significant consumer trends that um, you think will be sustained moving forward? Yeah, no problem. Um, I think there's, there's almost quite an obvious one, which is, is the move towards digital. And I think we've done all we can during the current crisis to keep as many branches open, so physical presence and telephony. But we are seeing more people move towards digital. Um, now, some of that is, is a natural move and some of that is a move that we've encouraged. So in the matter of a, a fortnight, we managed to launch a, a new chat facility called uh, Smart Agent Online. And we've seen a really large uptake of that facility. And so I think once we come through this, I, I envisage that digital adoption will remain particularly high. Now, that being said, I, I don't think it will remove the need for physical interaction or human interaction. So interestingly, the thing with the smart agent that we've done online is it's, it's chat with real people. There's a little bit of AI, but it's mainly real people. 
So what we're seeing is that the need for real human interaction for financial needs is continuing, but it's shifting more into a digital pattern. And I would envisage once we're through this that the um, general uh, acceptance, approval uh, of you know, such facilities will continue, but still require a lot, of, a lot of human touch as well. Okay, thank you. And then, you know, from a from a strategist point of view, um, you know, thinking around that financial services, because financial services has been quite unique through this um, process. And as much as you know, it's a must have. It's been maintained in very much. You know, we've got to have that connection. What are you seeing in terms of the brands that you're working with that reflects what Peter said? Yeah, I think um, I think that there has been, you know, that, that it feels like there's there's been a bit of a watershed moment. I feel as though, um, you know, for once the hyperbole uh, is 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 probably true um, in the sense that uh, uh, there's been a rapid. It feels like there's been a rapid adoption um of as peter was saying you know digital services um i think you only have to look at the growth in you know kind of d to c brands over this period of time um i think you only have to look at the adoption of e-commerce amongst the cohort of people that probably would never have even dreamt about purchasing uh direct through those sort of d to c brands in, in, in any other period of time and i think anyone that's worked in you know, kind of uh, e-commerce businesses or worked with, you know, e-commerce retailers or, you know, kind of uh, online uh, grocery brands, for example, they know that there is a, I think there's a watershed moment of once you've, once you've tapped a consumer into about four purchases from an online grocery perspective, you've kind of converted them into an online grocery shopper. And I think, you know, that's only four, that's a, that's a, that's a four or five week cycle. We've been on lockdown for, for months. So I suspect there's a huge amount of, Kind of quite substantial kind of entrenched behavior change that's happened around digital adoption that I think will last. But I agree with Peter that, you know, you still need, people still crave, we are still human social beings and we still crave a, um, a, a conversation with, with, a, with another human being. So um, I don't think, I don't think that means that the future is purely uh, uh, AI uh, communications with brands. Thank you. And I think what's interesting, touching on that, you know, food and the retail piece, Nick, you know, from a um, Kerry Foods point of view, you've had quite a different experience off the back of COVID, simply by the nature of the products that you provide. Can you tell me a little bit about the way you know, you're seeing things change and what's happening within your business? Sure. I mean, in the, in the food business, as you would imagine, we've seen some pretty significant changes in, in the last eight, eight or 10 weeks. Um, Clearly, there's been a huge growth um, in some of the traditional categories, um, you know, flour, butter, um, sausages, meats. So there's been a real resurgence and demand for some of those traditional uh, categories with a massive increase in scratch cooking. So um, with some of our brands in Richmond and Home Pride and those types of categories, the resurgence has, has been enormous and trying to cope with those huge levels of fluctuating demand has been a huge focus for us and our, and our factories. Um, while we try to you know, balance and ensuring that our people are safe in the factories, but ensuring that we can maximize the output against those categories to sort of satisfy the demand from our customers in, in the main retailers and you know, play, play a role in feeding the nation. So that's, that's been a big impact. Clearly there's some real decline in some other categories in terms of convenience and food to go. Categories like sandwiches have been really significantly impacted as people have been locked down. And there's been a real cha change in shopping behavior as, as people shop less, but you know, have bigger baskets when they, when they do shop uh, because they've been keen to get in and out of supermarkets more quickly. So there's some, been some significant changes that uh, we've been working hard and quickly to adapt to and stay closer to the, the customers and the retailers to make sure we can play our role in that. Do you think, I mean, it's interesting, that whole piece around, um, you know, the utilising flour, et cetera, going back to baking and originating food. Do you think that behaviour is going to be sustained or do you think it's sort of a, you know, it's simply, you know, people will do it now, but revert to type? I think um, I think people have have got back into some habits that they used to really enjoy. And I think probably home home baking is 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 one of those. I mean, our demand for the flour continues to be extremely strong at this at this point in in time. It's the sort of it's the new gold 
at this at this point as people want want some of that product so that they can interact i think it goes back to to gen's point around people want to interact at home and they're interacting in a different way with their friends and family and cooking and baking is one of the things that people can do together still so i think that that may endure through this and in, into the long term okay thank you Heather, you know, with the brands, we were talking yesterday again about, um, you know, one of your clients, Iceland Foods. Um, and I think, you know, interestingly for me and for the whole panel is in, in terms of the brands that you work with, what have you seen as being the biggest challenges? And, you know, where have you seen the, specifically that you've had to really home in and change the way that you're operating as a consequence? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting question and it has been and probably the same for you as well, Tracy, just a complete mixed bag in terms of our clients' response and um, the different camps that they that they fall into. So um, we've got our client, Iceland Foods, who, um, you know, all of a sudden we are, you know, stepping back from the normal sort of campaign development and encouraging people to go to, you know, stores to actually unbelievably having to communicate for people to slow down and stop buying food. Food. I mean, did you think we would ever have to communicate no. <laughs> that on behalf of one of our clients? I mean, you just couldn't make it up. I'll never forget that first time I queued outside a supermarket for just taking photos. I just couldn't, just couldn't believe it. So, you know, and to, and to have to shift our thinking to operational support for clients like that in terms of feeding the nation. So Iceland Foods were the first supermarket that adopted um, the silver hour. So prioritizing that shopping hour for, you know, vulnerable um, customers and elderly customers. Um, and, you know, and seeing the response of that, I think the, the most um, important thing for me in terms of counseling our clients is that our client, our consumer will always remember how brands and businesses behaved and we've you know for the last few years seen a huge rise in in boycotting um, and I think that has been very linked to you know um, how brands treat their employees and their sustainability credentials and I think this will be another one how did they behave during COVID how did they support me how did they support my family so that's that bucket of client and you know how how we can you know best support them to operationalize their business model and then we've had other clients who you know they we do quite a lot of travel and tourism and you know cruise uh, you know cruise ship liners and you know how i guess a challenge in terms of how are we going to facilitate a recovery and tracy you know we were talking yesterday about the thought of us jumping on planes week in week out again just seems inconceivable and you know how do we facilitate that recovery for our clients and I have to believe that it will it might look very different but it will so i think that you know having to and i found it incredibly you know interesting as interesting as something can be during a global pandemic but you know for us to actually be having you know to adopt different hats and ways of thinking for our for our clients in order to you know facilitate a, a reset a recovery and also to sustain some momentum that other clients have seen so you know it's been a it's a really interesting challenge no, that's right. And again, we were talking about this whole concept of, you know, brands and how they will be judged moving forward and the good ones and the bad ones. And, and I know that you had some very clear thoughts around um, the ones that are getting it wrong. Um, I, I feel as though I, I, I completely agree with um, Heather's, Heather's point on um, your point on on I don't I don't believe consumers will uh, uh, will be fast to forget or indeed forget at all. I think this this in many ways COVID has been has represented an opportunity uh, for, for for many brands to show their true colours. And I think uh, for some of the brands that acted in certain ways at the start of the pandemic, I believe that might be a rat in the moment for a few of them. Um, you know, you only have to look at. Um, how brands like you know kind of sports direct refused to shut their uh, warehouses at the beginning of the pandemic um uh, i think you know tim martin and weatherspoons were obviously very vocal about the fact that he was sort of refusing to shut his pubs to begin with but then they obviously since apologized and they've since realized you know that's kind of unacceptable um kind of uh, discourse i guess in such a, a, a such a volatile and, and and unprecedented climate and i and i, I believe consumers will remember those those brands, like you said, uh, you know, Heather, you know, talking about the silver hour and prioritizing people. And I think, um, you know, I think, uh, Tracy, you mentioned it at the start of the 
the conversation that 77 percent stat and i think i've seen even even more striking stats from um, another post-covid than the many post-covid reports but I, I believe i saw one coming out of the edelman's trust barometer around 90 percent of consumers are now demanding that brands put their employees first and i've never i've never seen those sort of stats before and i appreciate that obviously at the time of research we're in the middle of a pandemic so people's people's uh, emotions are naturally wired towards what they're going through in the immediate term but that's quite a stark um quite a stark warning i think to brands and businesses for the first time consumers are looking beyond beyond i suppose the 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 the, the kind of i suppose the superficial and actually looking beyond that and kind of looking at looking at how brands are treating the not only the customers but the, the, the their employees and i think it is those actions that that, that those positive actions that will be remembered and, and i think peter you were talking about your you know kind of the priority of making sure that your customers can reach you wherever and whenever possible during this pandemic and that that is an advertising that, that, that that's that's simply positive brand action and i think those will be that will be remembered and i think that you know that that, that that those those are the those are the actions that, that that I think we should be looking to as benchmarks for for kind of um, brand action going forward. I think that's a really interesting point, Peter. You know, I think you know going back to this, you know, the the way that we are, you know, as businesses behaving towards our employees will reflect an impact on what consumers choose to do moving forward. Do you think that um, brands drive customer behaviour? or do they reflect it no how do you how do you think the whole relationship is changing i think i mean building on what jim was saying again a moment ago i i think um definitely at the moment doing the right thing really matters and doing things that are aligned with your purpose i think you know businesses that had a purpose and lived and breathed it i think you can clearly see the difference between those and those those that haven't I think that it's a combination of, of, of your, your question, Tracy. I think, you know, ultimately, you know, for a brand like ours, we've done what we can to um, offer services at points where people really need them. So to help shape that behavior. But um, I guess with something like digital, a channel will only work if it's designed or works well for consumers. And what we find is that in the banking sector, you know, people aren't comparing banks with banks necessarily. You know, you're, 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 we all sample a range of brands and a range of experiences. We've probably all been through this through COVID. We've had interactions with multiple brands, some new ones, some we've dealt with before. We've all come away with a reaction about what it was like. You know, so what was it like at Iceland versus going to queue at the post office to post something versus visiting a bank? versus getting an order from Amazon. You know, we've got our reference point is multiple points. And I think from that, we shape the best of our experience. And particularly with digital, I think that drives some sense of what, what a good experience versus a bad experience is like. And certainly in the way we've looked to, to help and support customers is being very much based on, you know, something that is designed with a really good experience in mind. So it's not just go use this because we built it. It's actually, you know, we've designed something that we know um, works really well, has mass customer appeal, and it's got a really good experience behind it as well. So I think I think it's a combination of, of, of both points. Okay, thank you. And Heather, would you agree with that? Would you say that you know it, who's pushing who, and how is the dynamic working in terms of consumer versus brand? Yeah, and yeah, I was thinking about what I would say to that question. I think the um, I think that what I have found fascinating about um, that is that the answer to that question has changed week by week. So I think we all remember the first week when it was like, don't do anything that might be seen to profiteer, you know, keep your head down, just make sure you're providing a really good customer service. Everything was viewed through this, you know, really sort of, you know, critical lens. I was, I remember going through about 12 rounds on a CEO LinkedIn post of just, you know, make sure we don't say anything that could be seen to profiteer. And then about four weeks later, I was having a conversation with a different client saying, you need to say something, you need to do something. And how quickly that shifted. Um, so I do think, you know, I, I don't know whether it's led by by one or other, but I, I all I do know is that this situation changes week by week for customers, for brands and for businesses. And that will that will continue. That will continue when when we start to enter into what a possible recovery might look like and the reopening of society. 
um, and I and I have found that to be you know so challenging and interesting in terms of there isn't you know we often talk about when we're doing sustainability work or you know when we're developing new campaigns this is what right looks like this is the right thing to do and that's been a really complicated thing to navigate for you know for for our for our clients um, in order to make sure that we get it right. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think just build, building on that, I think yeah. um, it depends on what type of business you're in sometimes as well at, at what part of the journey. So for the past eight weeks, our primary focus probably as marketers uh, and, and brand owners has been looking after our people because we have about five and a half thousand people of which the majority of vast majority of those work in factories in our 15 factories. So making sure that they're well looked after, we have the right social distancing, we change shift patterns, we close lines to make them safe has been really important, has been the primary importance. And then the second focus for us has been um, making sure that we satisfy the changing uh, needs of our customers, so the main, the main retailers, to deliver food to them in the way in which they want it at the pace in which they, they want it. And actually those have been the primary focus for us in the, in the first phase rather than any brand communication because those have been the two most important tasks. And actually our marketers have had to move to more operational focus and customer retailer focus in their efforts um, as they simplify ranges and SKUs and work out how to get turn SKUs on and off as opposed to branded campaigns because that has been the big priority in, in the last eight weeks. For, for our business and for our customers and staying close to those customers has really borne fruit over that period. That's really interesting. And would you say, so again, from your point of view, from, I, I know you haven't actually been there very long. So in terms of access to client, this could be quite a challenging question, but have you seen a different dynamic um, across the different clients that you work on in terms of where the focus has been? Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, there has been. Uh, I think, as as Heather was saying, it ch every it's changing. The, the landscape is changing week by week, and I think COVID more generally, if anything, to learn from is the you know the the, the fragility of predictive modelling. Anyway, none of us saw any of this coming, um, and I think. Um, but I do. I, 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 there is a look. There, there, you could, I think. I suppose you've been many clients that I have been working on, whether it was my, in my previous job or, or the current job, is that it started off with a lot of soul searching and then into intensive kind of um, scenario planning, really, in terms of, um, I suppose, giving giving our clients, you know, the, at least some kind of clarity of vision and some kind of way forward. But I think that the new normal currently is how to how to be as adaptive uh, how to be as adaptive and as, as fleet of foot as possible as heather was saying almost on a weekly basis things are changing but i think um i think just to pick up on pete uh, on peter's point on the um on the belief uh, uh and the belief and purpose point i think is a really interesting one it's you know brands we've we've been talking about brand purpose for years now and i think um I think, um, it, in a way, this this crisis or this pandemic that we're currently living through has sort of, I suppose, exposed um, exposed the, the the kind of the, the surface um, the surface beliefs versus the kind of deep rooted, meaningful belief and and purposes that brands have. And I think, I think now more than ever, you look at the brands that are kind of, I suppose, winning is a is a, is a horrible term to use when people are losing their lives, but when you look at the brands that have taken those sort of positive steps, they are, they are deep rooted purposes that have been brought to life in an authentic, meaningful way. I often think about it as a, almost in my head, I'm kind of thinking about actually it's about connecting your belief with your behavior in a meaningful way. And I think um, you look at the likes of, I think Leon was a really interesting example of a brand where I believe their, per their brand purpose is something like um, good food that does good. Now, if you'd asked me 18 months ago uh, to talk about Leon's brand purpose of good food does good, I would, I would, I would have kind of gone, well, it sounds, it, it sounds quite, it sounds it's slightly like a platitude or it sounds actually quite obvious or it, it's not particularly, it, it's kind of, it sounds like any other food, modern food brand. And I'm sure they use good quality source, good quality produce and good quality ingredients, et cetera. Um, but suddenly post COVID that brand purpose was, was suddenly brought to life with their incredible kind of act of feeding the NHS. I think they were, the, you know, they were the pioneers 
of that kind of conglomerate. I think I believe it was like 13 or 14 other of their competitors. They they managed to kind of corral and join as a as a team of uh, of, of kind of restaurateurs to to feed key workers during this crisis. So you're suddenly going actually brand purpose suddenly goes beyond kind of corporate fridge magnet poetry for want of a better word into actual meaningful action um and i think that's that's what's that's what's been exposed i think i think that's you know going back to the point sort of nick that you were talking about as well in terms of you know that purpose and how the shift has happened within your business can i ask in terms of the provenance of your food that you know from a kerry foods point of view have people started asking is that are you seeing more of a concern or a questioning around you know the what sits behind your products and services? I, I think um, with most brands, people have a sort of working assumption of some level of provenance and some level of ingredients, even if it may not be extremely, extremely detailed. I think in the, in the last eight weeks, I think um, we've seen two things. One, clearly people have been wanting to get in and out of supermarkets quickly, yes? And they have tended in that period to go to trust, known trusted brands at scale that they recognize and will feel comfortable with. So I think undoubtedly some of the traditional trusted brands have benefited from that period. Across our, our, our customer care line, I guess, we get about 30,000 contacts a year um, around questions uh, and a whole array of areas. Um, consumers have had a bit more time at home um, and a bit more time to inquire and, and look behind the scenes, but we haven't we haven't really seen a spike in uh, either curiosity or questions around any of the provenance of our food. And I think probably because there's an, an understanding and acceptance on some of the traditional brands that they know that they are not asking too many more questions on. In newer areas or newer products, I think they might be more demanding, but not on things that they know and trust. And, and Peter, from that sort of ethical, you know, the understanding, the purpose of TSB and where it sits, and I'm bothered about what you're giving me as a customer, have you seen that shifting? Have you seen things that customers will no longer tolerate or they're pushing you towards? I think the, what's been really interesting is we've seen overall perception of banks generally improve through the last few weeks. And I think that's a combination of um, things that we've done working with the government, for example, the bounce back loan scheme for small businesses that's gone live across banks over the last couple of weeks. But there's also sustained activity from most banks to reach out to, to help customers at point of need. So I think there's a, from the research we do, there's a broad understanding that banks are doing everything they can to really help people at the point they need them the most. And if anything, we particularly have almost slightly over communicated with the real intent to get all our messages out and to show all the help that we can offer and provide. Because there are a variety of really different needs at the moment, aren't there? Whether someone's furloughed or not working or are working or working from home. And the, the big thing is about money and money worries and money confidence. And our purpose is about giving people money confidence or confidence with money. So actually right now more than ever, people need to feel confident with what their financial position will look like moving forward. So offering payment holidays, uh, you know, a, a view on a payment rates on overdraft and just you know, being very upfront and sorting those things very quickly has been really, really important for us. Um, so no, it's been a combination of things, I think. But, but at the moment, I think, um, you know, we've really aimed to step up. A number of other banks have stepped up. And I think uh, we're seeing that uh, so far uh, come back in some positive metrics, uh, you know, on the brand at the moment too as well. Thank you. And Heather, you know, across you, you work across a wide variety of brands. Have you seen across, you know, your range of, uh, of clients areas that you think I've had you have you as a business have had to push or encourage or, you know, um, enable your clients to think differently, to, to think about the customer and what the customer is prepared to do or not do? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, you know, by and large, most most of our clients and, and brands are you know incredibly customer centric i think the the pushing has come 
um, because we are all living in, you know, nine weeks that we've never, ever lived in before. So it just seems inconceivable that, you know, 10 weeks ago, I didn't know how to spell unprecedented and I had no idea what furloughing <laughs> was. And, you know, now I'm, I'm in this world and actually no conversation or idea is a stupid conversation or idea to be having with our clients. And, you know, the, and actually the, the pushing comes with the, you know, actually th this is, an, and I use this very um, sensitively when I talk about an opportunity, but I'll, I'll, um, I remember a night where I just sat and I just read about all the brands that were doing amazing things, Absolute Vodka making hand sanitizer, Burberry making scrubs and aprons. and you just think these guys are just coming from a, a completely different angle and that's where the conversation happens with our clients in terms of yes this is tough yes you know your business model might be pretty screwed for the next six months but what can you do in order to benefit people and what can you do to stay relevant and to do the right thing and those when we're not so much pushing well sometimes pushing conversations but also really interesting conversations and an opportunity for you know creativity and to think completely differently and you know what what could be what could be better for our clients thank you right i'm going to ask you all the same question now uh, which is i mean given that we've talked about this whole concept of you know shifting customer control you know thinking about what we need to do differently and also the fact that these talks are meant to give people prompts or ideas that they can use in, in their own businesses what would you be your you know top three four tips for helping to fulfill customer need um given we can't look forward much more than about a few months but if you had to look forward and you had got a crystal ball and you could look forward say six months time what would be your top three tips to make sure that brands deliver to customers more effectively nick Sure. I guess my the way the way I've and we've tried to think about it in our business is probably threefold, which is um, simplicity, agility, and then looking out for each other. Um, and um, we've tried to simplify our business as much as possible. We've tried to stay agile. Back to the previous comments about responding week by week or day by day, and we've also tried to stay true to the values of the organization and common amongst that is a sort of better together spirit um, where we look out for each other and if we do those three things over this period then i think we'll come out in good shape thank you again what would your top tips be um i think um i think the first I, it's i think the first would probably be um let's let's return to um i suppose a let's re let's re let's return to a principle that 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 the brands brands are here to help people whether to help people to decide on what to buy or actually provide some kind of useful um useful service to brands so i'd almost i'd almost urge a, a slight rethink and not i hope it doesn't sound too fundamental but a slight rethink around uh shifting a pivoting pivoting away from the notion that brands are simply passive private enterprises um into the notion that brands can be more public active public service i think that is a, that is a big shift and we've talked a big game as we all know for many years um you know from simon sinek um through to kind of brand purpose and the why i think now's the time to really follow through with the talk and i think um, as we've been discussing, those brands that that have been have really sort of shone out. I think they're all linked to one point, to be honest, which is about putting people first. And I think um, uh, putting your customer first, genuinely putting your customers first, genuinely putting your employers employees first, um, and behaving in a sort of a society centric centric way. Yeah, agree. I mean, there's I, I read a stat somewhere that said fifty five percent of people felt that companies. Um, had a greater impact than the government mm. so companies and brands and that in itself is a really interesting concept just building on your point in terms of what is yeah. the role of a brand and how does it operate mm. yeah okay peter from your perspective what would your top tips be well i think outside of um, the, the whole theme around living and breathing your purpose i think the first one for me would be about listening i think listening more than ever to your customers to your staff 
what's going on, what's going on in people's lives and what role does your brand play? And that's, in our view, that's continuing to evolve. So I think listening as a brand is more important than ever, whether it's social media or dedicated research, really take the time to listen. And um, the second one, this touches on a couple of, uh, of the last things, which is care, genuinely care, show care, care for your staff, care for your customers, and use that listening to genuinely, not just show you care, but practically provide ways to help and care more. I think the third one is to, is to question and challenge. You know, I think we're all saying, you know, I, I, I probably want a bit bored of hearing about when we come into the new, the new normal. Um, you have no idea what that's going to be. We haven't got a crystal ball. But I think this is the time to really question and challenge and say, when we come through this, when we come through the next phase where we end up, you know, should we still be doing the things we were going to do in the same way? And that comes down to, you know, within my role, even basic things like tone of voice and communication. You know, things we plan to do later in the year, should we do them in the same way? Should our tone change? Should our approach change? You know, and, and where, where do we end up? I remember when the banking crisis happened in 2009, 2010, doing a campaign for an insurance company. We had a huge debate because the ad had humor in it. It was like, should we be doing anything that's funny, that's humorous? Now, quite rightly, I think you should do, but tone feels really important at the moment. I think we can point to brands where we feel the tonal shift has been good and others where the tonal shift hasn't occurred or has not been a good one. So I think all those points interlink, um, but don't feel afraid to question and challenge at the moment. It's the right time to do it. Super, thank you. And Heather, what would your tips be? Um, so I think my first would be to, um, to encourage um, our clients and brands to demonstrate true leadership. Um, and I think that's the internal and external, um, you know, making sure your house is in order um, and prioritizing that before you communicate externally. Um, and to not hide behind, you know, I think what I've, you know, enjoyed so much in terms of uh, external communications, you know, during this time is that, you know, more leaders have stepped out than ever before. And, you know, we've seen some crazy stats around, you know, LinkedIn and, you know, how leadership uh, communications, how well leadership communications have been received there. But, you know, I'd love to see the end of hiding behind a spokesperson said and, you know, actually standing there as, um, as, a, as a leader and communicating. Um, my second, I think, and this is the kind of struggle I've had with some clients is, you know, acknowledging the challenges, but not being frightened of them. If there's always going to be one thing that's going to hold you back and what if we get asked about this, should we still do this? And there is no perfect solution. So acknowledging like that we are we are able to do x we can't do y yet um but we are working through that and that we're all on a journey with this and to and to be up front and not hide away from the challenges that your business and brand is experiencing um, and i think i've touched on this earlier but it's important to me and i i think that um we can be using this as an opportunity to think creatively and you know we've heard some amazing stats in this podcast and one i read um this week is that 66 percent of um customers in in the uk really care about a green recovery um for in terms of in terms of post covid uh, in a post covid world and you know we've seen incredible stats around you know pollution and you know amazing pictures that we haven't seen for 20 years and you know how how can you how can our clients and our businesses and our brands use that this time in order to focus on that what that might mean and and creative thinking around that and real business strategy around that so you know whilst this is a very busy time for some well it's a pretty busy time for for, for most businesses and brands but i do believe that there is an opportunity to think differently think creatively and to not be you know afraid of those challenges Thank you. No, I think, do you know, what's interesting is that there is a, there's very much a theme coming through here, isn't there, that, you know, what I think what we're seeing is, you know, consumers are demanding more, but actually, you know, that concept of transparency, whether it be over supply chain or chains or honesty, you know, having strong CSR policies, but living it, not just talking it, you know, and how brands treat their employees is becoming more and more important. Um, and I do think, actually, and I think, you know, we'd all agree, and certainly from Havas's point of view, we are seeing a more discerning customer. So I mm. think, you know, what is going to be so important is that the ones that will, 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 will win um, are the ones that actually do deliver against that, that sense of what a true purpose is or deliver meaning. So it'll be interesting to see what goes on moving forward. I think they're more, uh, to build on your point, Tracy, I think they're discerning, but I'd, 
I'd actually sort of combine that with Peter's point on questioning. They are questioning yes. themselves. And I think Peter's right. I think now more than ever you go, if nine, I read, I think it was something like 9% of the UK, only 9% of Brits want to return to how things were prior to this crisis. So that's, you know, the vast majority of this country, are, 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 they're thinking, they're rethinking everything in their lives at the moment. And I think, you know, absolutely. Now, now's the imperative for, for for us to do the same and, and in, innovate in 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 completely new ways. We can we can you know we can we can change things. You know, we can change change the course of change the direction of of the brands and businesses that we work with um, in the long term. Now, I agree. So I think we're out of time, but can I just say thank you very much to everybody for joining today. Um, and I know this is the first in a series, so it'll be interesting to see what happens next and return to this in about six months time and do it again and find out what we've delivered and what's changed. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you.